So uh, doc, Dr. Ralph Flexelbaum, we're very lucky to have him talking to us today. So he's the uh, Daniel K. Ludwig Distinguished Service Professor of Radiation and Cellular Oncology, and he's the chair of the Department of Radiation and Cellular Oncology. He did his um, undergraduate at University of Wisconsin, where he, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Ralph, but I believe you were a uh, basketball player, right? I, for a while. Yeah, and then um, he did his medical school at University of Illinois at Chicago, and then residency training at a uh, Harvard program uh, where he was initially as an attending physician and then came here to the university uh, where he's been chair for um, uh, some time. Uh, he is an international expert on um, the uh, biologic me mechanisms of tumor spread and metastasis and also is um, kind of the brains behind the concept of oligometastases which the patient with rectal cancer that I presented to you is an example of oligometastasis. And I think I'll stop there and let Dr. Wexelbaum explain. Well, thanks for a very gracious introduction, Dan. Um, as I said, these are my disclosures, but they're old and it's off and I apologize. Uh, how do I advance it? Or should I just say next screen, slide, please? Yeah, uh, Ralph. Uh, just, just before you 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 get going, I just want to add to the introduction that Ralph was one of those um, senior faculty that I have known to be a great mentor uh, to to anyone that is interested in pursuing research intensive uh, careers in oncology. And as chair of uh, radiation oncology. It's really an honor that he accepted our invitation to speak to you. Um, please pay attention to what he has to say to you. And then those of you who are interested in radiation oncology, make sure you follow up with Dan and then you have an appointment to see him personally because he will inspire you and maybe he'll get you to work with him. And that will be a sure path to success in life. So Lord, Ralph, thank you for showing up. For me, listen, I, I'm flattered to be asked, and uh, I, I, I'm overwhelmed by the introduction and the kind words, and thank you. Um, All right, okay, I have to go to my other meeting, but thank you so much, Ralph, bye-bye. Yeah, I'm advance the slide. Uh, so you have to request control of the screen. Next slide, we'll, we'll go. We'll next go. slide, you can just tell me. Yeah, so, I would say the major uh, problem in cancer is metastasis, spread of the tumor, and it accounts for uh, 80 to 90 percent of cancer mortality. And it's widely regarded as disseminated and incurable. And it's treated metastasis, and this is a broad general statement, are treated with systemic treatments, usually chemotherapy, now immunotherapy and targeted therapies, but with the exception of pediatric tumors, leukemias and lymphomas, and the rare case of immunotherapy, um, it, it's generally palliative, not curative. Um, there, there are exceptions, of course, of uh, half the melanoma patients or 40% are probably cured, but in general, if you've got a metastatic solid tumor, it ends badly. Next slide. Next slide. Good. So, so the study of metastasis is really taken off, and I'm not going to go through this all. But the general idea is that uh, that when the tumor cells spread, they impair the end organ function of vital organs, or make patients so sick that they die. And you can see from this old New England Journal slide that there are a variety of molecular steps. These are cancer specific. Um, they're uh, whether, the, and I'll go over this in a second, how, how the tumor gets out, how it survives, how it gets into the secondary organs are very complex and there's tons of literature on this. And uh, I would say the two leading lights in this have been Juan Massinga at MSK and Bob Weinberg at MIT. And next slide, please. Next slide, Aviva. And uh, this is just a, a slide to remind you, or to remind me to tell you that every uh, normal tissue or every normal tumor seems to have its own microenvironment. Next slide, please. Uh, 
So what, what I'm going to do is, th this is going to become material to my discussion later. So tumors become vascularized, vascularized the tumor cells get, become detached, they intravasate. As I said, they survive in the circulation, they stick to blood vessel walls, they intravasate, and they colonize. And I will be talking about adhesion, adhesion invasion, and migration as the discussion goes on. It's always been interesting to me that um, that these are really, uh, I, I hate to say perversion, but, but abnormalities of normal processes. So this is pretty much the way inflammation responds to an infection or in really normal processes, how uh, the embryo develops with, with these kinds of mechanisms. Next slide, please. So the general view of metastasis, as I said, it's all over all the time. They're all over all the time. So Sam Holman, who was the dean here for a guy I worked for in Boston as a resident and junior and then senior attending, and then he was the dean, and then he quit being the dean and went back to being a radiation oncologist. And we wrote this paper in 1995. I think that's his high school graduation picture. And I think that was my hair and my teeth at the time. So what did we say? We said that metastasis was a spectrum, that it's not overall all over all, over all the time. That, and that if they, that there were limited states of spread and that within these limited states of spread, ablative therapy, and this, by the way, is a therapy agnostic talk, that um, w whether it was surgery or radiotherapy or uh, uh, cryotherapy, could cure patients with limited disease. And we even envisioned new kinds of radiotherapy. And this was, uh, Dan was showing you stereotactic radiotherapy. And so, it, it, so I we thought this is a great idea. We sent it in, and the paper was rejected by all the reviewers. Nasty, nasty comments. So I thought, well, okay. And then Dr. Hellman, I, I, I hesitate to he, say he was friends with the editor of jur the Journal of Clinical Oncology, but I think the journal, the editor was a little afraid of him. He sort of pushed him to publish his editorial. So this was an idea whose time hadn't come. And even my friends and colleagues sort of shook their head after this appeared and okay, that's life. Next slide. So, so what did we say that's so controversial? Well, that metastasis represented a spectrum in number, organs, and pace, that subsets might be potentially curable, and that uh, cytoreduction with systemic agents can produce a state which has since been called oligoprogressive, and you could eliminate the uh, resistant clones with metastasis-directed therapies. Seemed not very revolutionary. Next slide. Uh, so, yeah. So, before I get, so there are two papers that came out. One, Tom Treasure, who's a thoracic surgeon here, uh, not here, he, he visited here. This is a nasty edited article, nasty. He, he sort of implied uh, that radiation oncologists were doing this to make money. I mean, if you read it carefully. And I remember going to Dr. Hellman and then we said, well, some publicity is better than no publicity. And then the other one where I'm an author, what uh, David Palma said, who came to do some important trials, said, you know, maybe patients would be cured anyway. And I said, well, you know, are you crazy? Patients with metastatic cancer die, you know, but so this was a damage control authorship. Next slide. So there were numerous papers. The surgeons had written about this stuff for years. And what they, they had pointed out, and this, these are old studies and large studies, in liver metastasis and below in lung metastasis, where patients, they had a fair number of patients who were cured with metastatic disease and not just one, people had remarked on single site metastasis. So this clinical risk score was developed by a surgeon named Human Fong for liver metastasis that, uh, from a colon and rectal cancer. And he developed a clinical risk score and I'll come back to this later. So he said, 
the risk score if you had a tumor larger than 5 cm, a high pre-op CEA, I think he had more than five or three metastasis, I forget. So those are all surrogates for tumor burden. Disease-free interval of less than 12 months or greater than 12 months, this is a surrogate for PACE. And a node positive primary, which is sort of a surrogate for biology, these were highly prognostic. And then the, the, there was a uh, big review by Pastorino and colleagues a year after we published our paper, but clearly these went back 20 years. And you can see even at 12 years, uh, and, uh, any number of patients were cured with pulmonary resection. Again, some of these, especially with small, you can see the five-year survival, and these are not corrected for, these are just alive over dead. So the, the tumor-specific survival here was probably quite good. Next slide. So nonetheless, uh, everybody's a hero except where they live. And I tried to get my uh, colleagues in medical oncology to, um, uh, to embrace this concept with very little success. So two things. One, I would say this even if Dr. Olapati was on, there's only one, whether you're a radiation or surgical or medical oncologist or immunotherapist, you have to become an expert in the natural history of cancer. So if you want to see, be any kind of an oncologist, come see Dan or come see me, because it's the way you think about things. So Neil Maida, who's now in private practice in Chicago, went to Dr. Vokes' clinic, and he looked at sites of failure in lung cancer. And what he found was that most patients failed in less than five sites, actually less than three organs with less than five metastases, something like that. Now, it's not a great paper because it's CT and not autopsy and so on and so forth, but they convinced my colleagues that we should do a clinical trial. Next slide. So this is a paper. Uh, and again, this is not so much a therapy thing as it is a natural history discussion. And essentially, 12 or 15 years later, 20% of these patients are alive. These are patients treated with SBRT that Dan described with a bunch of different histologies. This is the first uh, started years before any other trial. Next slide. And Dan's already described uh, the uh, nice technical things we do. Next slide. And so this is something that came out years later by Allison Ashworth. And this shows uh, cures in patients who had oligometastasis from a variety of different sites. The only reason I'm showing it to you is not to push one therapy over another because some of these are surgery or mixed radiotherapy and surgery, just to make the point that this is pl a plausible uh, thing. Now, if you look at the far right, it's quite interesting. This is a paper on metastatic lung cancer. So if patients had the primary resected and developed metachronous, that is not at the same time metastasis, the five-year survival is 50%, which is better than primary lung cancer. If they got synchronous metastasis and or had positive lymph nodes, it's very bad. So again, it's, it's tumor volume, it's pace, and, and it's whether you had a, one had a, uh, a lymph node. Next slide. Let's go to the next slide. Aviva, next slide, please. Oh, it shifted on my screen. Did, did no one, is it not shifting for you? No, it's not moving. Biology of oligometastasis? Yeah. Next slide, please. Oh, I'm sorry. You passed yeah. So the most important thing I felt, and I think Dan actually worked on some of these, was to, to really say, is there a biological basis for oligometastasis? This is, was quite a lift, and I'm not 100% sure we made this, so how, what do we do? Well, this is the ultimate in translational research, although maybe it's translational observation. So we got human tumor samples, looked at microRNAs. Now, why microRNAs? Well, at the time, it was the only thing we could get out of paraffin. Did some target prediction, did in vitro studies, in vivo experiments, and went back to people for validation. Next slide, please. So you all probably know more about microRNAs than I do. 
essentially, and I'm not going to go through it, but essentially they're negative regulators of gene regulation. Uh, they're worth reading about. Uh, there's at least one Nobel Prize. This is, um, you know, obviously an old slide, but um, uh, they turn out to be very important. Next slide. So the reason I showed you the clinical study was not to pat myself on the back particularly, but because this was a beginning. So here we, we were able to get, and this is sort of pathetic in retrospect, five primaries in METS, 20 primaries in nine METS. So we got a prioritized list of microRNAs, but these microRNAs predicted for a lot of metastasis. Next slide. So the top one was 200C, and there have been any number of papers that have described 200C as a suppressor of epithelial mesenchymal transition, which is important in getting out of the primary for metastasis and was, is a widely known metastasis suppressor. Nonetheless, in our group, in our hands, it was associated with a lot of metastasis. And when we transfected cells with this microRNA, they became polymetastatic. So I thought this is pretty good. We couldn't get it published. I mean, we finally did. None of these have been in great journals. Next slide. So, the, so this just is what, what I told you that EMT, oh, okay. So there was a paper by, uh, let me do, yeah, by Yubin Kang, who's a very outstanding scientist at Princeton who works on metastasis. So they found the same thing we did, that 200C to a very complicated suppression of SEC23A actually enhanced metastasis. So I, I felt good about it, but obviously one swallow doesn't make a spring, but at least it encouraged us to keep going. Next slide. So the next thing, we, we, as I said, at the time we didn't have long follow-up. We didn't have many cases that we got the biopsies from. So Mark Ferguson here is a professor of thoracic surgery, very, very technically gifted surgeon who's pretty conservative. So he had 63 patients with long follow-up and we were able to get biopsies from these resected specimens. These were one patients with one to five metastasis who were followed for at least 16 months. So this was interesting. When you, when you looked at the clinical outcome, it was the pace. That is, they, they never recurred or they recurred slowly. And you can see these green triangles are, are associated with a very good survival and a slow pace. And the bottom left is associated with that red line going straight down. So this suggested that pace, which sounds like it's associated with growth, and maybe it is, and we'll discuss it more, um, is, is a key determinant here. Next slide. So then we got the microRNAs out of this. And so you're probably looking, when you're used to looking at DNA array, red is up and green is down. With microRNA, it's just the opposite. And this was a pretty, uh, this was done by Yves Lucier, who's a biostatistician, and Nikolai Hodorev. And what, what these guys showed was, was remarkable, that um, microRNA signature associated with fast growth and death. And when these microRNAs were upregulated, they were associated with slow growth and long-term survival. Now, I was so happy. I was saying, oh, we're going to get a really high-profile paper. Well, no, no, we didn't have a validation set. And I think there still really aren't validation sets for oligomets. Nonetheless, it suggested uh, th there was a biologic basis to this, so we wanted to keep going. Next slide. So th this is, uh, I, Dan, you were involved in some of this, right? Okay, well. Yeah. So. Sorry. So yes, so, so where do we go next? Well, we had these two groups, the surgery group and the radiotherapy group. So we looked at the microRNAs and I thought there for sure would be overlap and there's out of all these microRNAs, only three overlapped and it, it didn't come too much. However, what did overlap were genes, the microRNA targeted genes that were involved in, in uh, 
invasion, adhesion, or adhesion, invasion, migration, the AIM phenotype. So we then focused on the lung cancer group because we had the most data. These microRNAs that associate with the best prognosis were in chromosome location 14Q32. And what we then did, we took the three top microRNAs that had tar at least two targets in the AIM phenotype. This was done by Abinidu Powell, who's a surgeon, the guy's a genius, and John Petroda, who's a colleague of mine and Dan's, and was a Pritzker student, that these guys are really smart. And what they found was that oh. there were two, there were four genes, but that I'm just showing two of them here, ROC kinase and TGF beta R2, were associated with the AIM phenotype. And the idea here is that upregulation of these RNAs might suppress ROC kinase and TGF beta 2, and they would, uh, would then uh, enforce the oligometastatic phenotype. Next slide. So, the, so here, so now we transfected three of, we've actually transfected all four, only three really worked, but we were able to phenocopy the oligometastatic phenotype in a highly metastatic breast cancer line. Next slide. Also, um, uh, we, we did some in vitro studies and showed on the left here that in fact, at least uh, when we knocked down TGF beta 2, we suppressed adhesion. Now, remember, the, the less adhesion, the better if those tumor cells are floating around. Both uh, shRNAs uh, uh, decreased TGF beta and, and ROC kinase. Next slide. Also, um, Go Oshima, who is a surgeon, I had lots of surgeons in my lab. These guys are great, they work like crazy. He is a, was a surgeon from Japan who was in the lab for two years. And what Go showed was that all four of those microRNAs suppressed liver metastasis. So, I mean, this doesn't necessarily prove this is going on in humans, but it, it, it lends strength to the fact there's a biological phenotype. Next slide, please. So then we, we, we decided to investigate this more uh, intensely. Again, this was Go Oshima and Nikolai Hodorev, uh, who sadly uh, passed away last year. And also you can see Sean, uh, some uh, Jessica Jetsi, a radiation oncology resident. Of course, Mitch Posner, who's head of surgical oncology. Next slide. So this is a little bit of, or it's a lot of an oversimplification, but the idea, at least with DNA methylation, is that if you methylate uh, a DNA that one suppresses transcription if you demethylate it with demethylating agents like 5-azocytogene, one reactivates transcription. It gets a little complicated because one methylates uh, histones and all kinds of non-histone proteins. But I, this is certainly true to some degree. Next slide. So if you look at this locus, it's very interesting. Uh, so 14Q32 is a hot spot in the genome for microRNAs. The data I showed you before, we corrected for the fact it was a hot spot, and it was still highly significant that these microRNAs were involved in the same phenotype. If you look at this map, this MEG3 low, so what we showed, and I'm sparing you being tortured, is if MEG3 is methylated, it blocks the binding of the transcription factor CTCF. If you add 5 as a cytidine, you demethylate the MEG3 promoter, CTCF binds and it transcribes the RNA, microRNAs. Next slide. So what they show, this shows a dose response curve for increased transcription of the microRNAs following 5 as a cytidine. Next slide. And when you add 5 azacytidine, what one sees is a suppression of liver metastasis following intrasplenic injections. Next slide, please. So what I showed you was inferential data from humans that suggest that Patients who at least don't have an aggressive or limited metastatic phenotype or oligometastasis have a biological basis. We, we 
we put this in the context of microRNAs and genes that are involved in the metastatic process. We had a molecular basis for this and we showed you could reverse this phenotype. So, so the next thing is, well, what about patients? So as I indicated, it's very hard uh, to, get a hold, to get a hold of specimens. So this was Mark Talmonti and Mitch Posner from uh, North Shore and here. These two surgeons are really, really fantastic people. They had 134 patients with limited liver metastasis from colon cancer. So with the uh, help of Sean Petroda and the Ludwig Foundation for Cancer Research, because I didn't have a grant to do this, and, and I'm sort of giving you the broad strokes here, we did RNA-seq, microRNA, hybrid captured DNA-seq, MSI analysis. And it, so MSI is uh, microsatellite instability, but it's, it's got to do with uh, mismatch repair. None of these patients were mismatch repair defective. What I should tell you is patients who are mismatch repair defective in colon cancer don't respond to checkpoint inhibitors. I'm sorry, colon cancer in general doesn't respond to immunotherapy, at least in terms of checkpoint inhibitors that um, MSI, that patients who have uh, uh, microsatellite instability, so this is mismatch repair. They make a lot of errors in their DNA. They have a high mutational burden and they do respond to immunotherapy. All of these patients had one to three liver metastasis were resected and were treated, excuse me, with perioperative chemotherapy. Next slide. Next slide, please. Yeah. So this was Sean, the work of Sean Petroda. And what Sean showed was, if you took, if you looked at DNA sequencing, we, we got mutations characteristic of colon cancer, but we didn't get, um, uh, but none of these were predictive particularly. What was predictive, and this is with this SNF uh, analysis, which to be honest, I couldn't explain it to you, but it's sort of a way of randomly associating things. It turns out that you could get three, one got three distinctive clusters of microRNA RNA networks, some of which were involved in the original studies I just showed you. What one has here are three distinctive groups with two, pretty much two distinctive outcomes. Next slide. Next slide, please. Uh, so, it, no, no, one back, please. One back. So now, if you add those clinical risk scores that I told you about from Human Fong, remember tumor burden, pace, so on and so forth, these become highly predictive uh, in terms of how patients do. So if you're in the low risk group, you can see the survival with metastatic liver cancers, an astounding 90%, and it go, the next goes to about 40%. And the high risk you can see goes straight down. Next slide. Next slide. Yeah. So, so what's in these groups? So the, so the one that jumped out at me was this low risk immune group with immune genes. And obviously the stromal group does the worst. Um, and the, many of these genes are known to be associated with uh, bad outcomes. And the, there's an intermediate group with DNA damage and cell cycle, et cetera, et cetera. These specific mutations are characteristic of colon cancer. They characterize these groups, but they're not good for classifications. The other thing in terms of pace, patients in the low, all, all three groups had recurrences. But when the, um, when the patients in the low risk group had resections, they were cured, or as far as we know, they're cured. And in the high risk group, when they had resections, um, they, they, they went on to develop uh, distant metastasis. Next slide, please. So if you look at the genes in the low-risk immune group, they look just like genes that are predictive for response to immunotherapy. But we don't know, um, we don't, we, but, but we know they don't respond to immunotherapy but they do respond to surgery and chemotherapy. So I personally, I find this very interesting. So what's going on here? Next slide. So I, you, I'm not an expert on this, but 
there's this theory about immuno editing that maybe you had in your first year clinical path course, but this is popularized by Robert Schreiber, but this goes way, way back and, and Lloyd O. So the idea is that when tumors come up, your immune system eliminates them. And eventually they get mutations and they, they, now they're in equilibrium. And when they escape, there's an immunosuppressive microenvironment. And I am sure it's much more complicated than this. Nonetheless, what I showed you is suggestive of that. Next slide. So this is just a summary of what I told you so far. Um, it, it's just a graphic. Next slide. So to this point, I'm not done. Some patients have oligomets and they can be cured with ablative therapy. That seems to be true. And it's too bad Dr. Olapati's not on or Dr. Han because they would dispute this, but this is pretty common presentation for cancer. Secondly, patients can be identified through clinical features and molecular parameters. And maybe I'll talk about oligo progression if we have time. Next slide. So, I mentioned the specter of the immune system. So there's a guy named Jérôme Gallon in Paris, and I like to say his name because it sounds like I know French, but I don't. And Gallon had this idea that the immune contexture, and he does this mostly by H and E, at least initially, at the infiltrating edge of a tumor was determinative of outcome. Next slide. And what he shows in stage one colon cancer is that if you have a poor immune contexture, you're out of luck. And in stage two, you're out of luck, but not quite, a, the difference isn't quite, well, this is pretty bad. So next slide. And so now what about a metastasis? So this is a conglomeration of a lot of hard to read papers, but essentially what this shows is if patients, and here I believe he goes up to seven metastases, not three, that if these are patients who had resection and by and large res resection or resection and chemotherapy, that if you have a good immune score, that you do better than if you have a bad immune score, just like the primary tumors. Next slide. And what I find interesting here is, and this is a summary of a couple of papers actually, if you have a good immune score, you're more likely to have less metastasis than if you have a bad immune score, which is sort of what Sean showed. Next slide. Also, he says in his, his papers that um, it, it's number and immune score, which is what we say, and that to a degree, remember these are patients who have more Mets than we had, to a degree, the good immune score trumps number, but eventually, um, uh, eventually things uh, don't do well. And, and I think what this tells you is that the clinical, the clinical number of clinical parameters tell you something, the molecular biology tells you something, the host immune system tells you something, they're conflated, and I don't think we know the whole story. Next slide. So what about, what, what about the tumor cells? Well, and, and remember, this is all around the, the idea of oligomets. There is a, uh, a study called in, in done at the Crick Tracer RX. It's a UK thing. Uh, this happens to be their study on renal cell carcinoma. And they defined in renal cell carcinoma um, a less aggressive and more aggressive evolutionary subtypes. And essentially, um, uh, I, the, the thing that's most determinative here is proliferation and the weighted genetic index, which is a, a surrogate for copy number variation. And um, next slide. So if you read their paper, which is by uh, Turalashik, I can't say her name. So first they show that uh, if there's a locus very close to ours that was uh, seemed to be prognostic for doing better. And in this paper, they actually talked about oligometastasis and they referenced me, I could have wept. <laughs> and they had another locus on chromosome nine. This is all DNA sequencing, by the way. Next slide. Next slide, please. And if you look at patients who they called oligometastatic by, um, by group, what you can see is that about 80% of the patients who were treated 
with uh, ablative therapies, here it was mostly surgery or radiotherapy, were cured by all, or, or at least had long-term survival. Next slide. And they talk about, uh, they do some of this uh, evolutionary tracing and that, you know, punctated evolution is this explosive um, and, and widespread development of metastatic disease. Branched evolution is what it says, it's more linear. And then there's a really what they call linear evolution where there's not much mutation. But they put the oligometastatic paradigm into really uh, molecular co consequences. This is, uh, again, focused on the tumor cells. And I'm sure it's more complicated than that. But nonetheless, they, they really did this the right way. Next slide. So again, some patients have oligometastatic disease. I've showed you that, I think, that they can be cured with ablative therapy as much as life is curable. They can be identified through clinical features and molecular parameters. Again, tumor and host. And some patients with oligoprogressive disease can be cured. Next slide. So what do we do about more widespread disease? Next slide. So this is a study on radiofrequency ablation with patients up to, I believe, nine metastases. It's a phase two study of chemotherapy and radiofrequency ablation versus chemotherapy alone. And you can see even at 12 years, there's long-term survivors in the radiofrequency ablation and chemo group. So I think this concept uh, of oligo, or at least the spectrum, the spectrum is, um, is uh, is applicable in the context of may maybe even the majority of patients with metastatic disease. Next slide. So I wrote this with Sean Petroda again, a Pritzker student, uh, just smart as a whip. And what we said is, look, there's got to be, or what we really, you know, we we tend to stage tumors by TMN. How big the tumor is? Do they have nodes? Do they have metastasis? Yes or no. And, uh, and, and then there's certain, pro, you know, molecular uh, identifiers of outcome or therapeutic intervention. But what we said here is that what you re one really ought to do to get an accurate determination of whether, at least whether or not to use a, a blade of therapies in context with systemic therapies and to determine whether patients are curative is to integrate a molecular and a clinical staging. Next slide. I will skip this one. Next slide. So just, uh, we're going on kind of long. So there's two additional considerations, uh, pace of progression and long-term follow-up. And next slide. So in a lot of these trials, it's going to be tricky. This is a paper in Nature that I pulled, you know, I, I guess I won't be flying anywhere for a while. I was stuck on a plane in coach. And I, you know, I printed out a paper to read, and this is, you know, I just I run out of stuff to do. So I started looking through the supplements after the American Airlines magazine. <laughs> and if you, this is remarkable in that there are patients who uh, who have four recurrences in breast cancer, but the pace of their disease is so slow. Looking at this, like 45 percent of them are alive, alive at 15 years, and if you look early, 90 percent of them are alive. This is at the ER positive, and even in the ER negative, it's true. So I think in some tumors that are really have a slow pace of progression, it's going to be hard to tell from ablative therapy trials whether this oligo paradigm, or at least at, at least whether the ablative aspects of the therapeutic paradigm are going to be so. Next slide. Finally, this is a little edgy, and it's too bad Fumi is not because she jumped through the computer and choked me. But if you really think that, um, that, that tumors are limited in sites and progression, could you use ablative therapies as adjuvant? So what do I mean by adjuvant? Well, if you take out a breast lump, you give adjuvant radiation to control it in the breast. But we give systemic chemotherapy or hormone therapy to control it systemically. Next slide. So next slide, please. So this shows a PSMA scan. It's very, yeah, very sensitive. 
And you can see, so this isn't a patient with prostate cancer. Now suppose patients came in and these are the only two sites. Rather than give systemic therapy, you could actually ablate this. There are some trials now where this is being done to delay hormone therapy, but um, I could see doing this much earlier in the state of the, of the disease as scanning agents get better. Next slide. Next slide, please. I think I'll spare you the oligoprogressors. Next slide. And this just shows metastasis can metastasize to each other, but another good reason to use ablative therapies, even if there's a lot of, a lot of disease. Next slide. Okay, this is a, a random, and this is the last point I'll make. This is a randomized trial of patients with varying cancers, and there's a lot wrong with it. It was published in The Lancet of patients who got standard of care for their therapy, who then got ablative radiotherapy. So if you look on the, it's, it, the ablative part is better and it, both in terms of overall survival and progression free. But what I would point out is reading this carefully, there's some problems in randomization. I, I think more patients with more favorable disease were put in the ablative arm, but also if you look carefully, the overall survival is better, but, but it's much better than the Earth, double the progression-free survival. So, so here I'm using progression-free as a surrogate for cure, which may or may not be so. I don't think they hit the target in all these lesions, number one. And number two, another interpretation of this is that even if you didn't cure them, you slowed them down, uh, but, but that everybody would eventually die. So I guess, it, it, the, whatever ablative therapy has to be uh, given, is given, it ought to be, uh, it, it's got to obviously be effective and you got to do it right. Next slide. Next slide. So, so in the broad scheme, no, go back please. In the broad scheme of things, I would say that, that this idea that cancer is all over all the time, or that it's, 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 it's systemic, it's a canard. That cancer is a spectrum of metastatic cancer, primary cancer, it's a spectrum of disease, and even within the same cancer, it's different diseases. And this is not the way oncology thinks about this. Any oncologic specialty, it's all, they mostly, you know, there's obviously exceptions. It's binary. I think that's not the way to think about it. I think that molecular subtypes, will be complemented by clinical risk stratification, which is a surrogate for stage. And I think this ought to be done for metastasis. Gene expression in, uh, informs therapy, and by that I mean the molecular biology of it. The oligophenotype is a complex relationship between tumor and host. And what we want to know is, does the immune status, is that part of determining a, a, a disease extent? And I guess my take home message would be without uh, lobbying for one form of therapy or another, that, that the most important thing you can take from this is that, that a lot of what you hear isn't so and, and, and needs to be challenged. And I'll stop there. Great. Thank, thank you very much, Dr. Um, oh, yeah, I should say that um, I, the NIH, the, the Ludwig was a major supporter of this. And a very generous guy named uh, Vincent Fogley, I think. And then there's a lot of people did this. All right, great. Uh, are there any questions from the students? Yeah, it's tough to do this without um, looking into your eyes. <laughs> yes. Uh, Oh, Sorry, I'm having trouble understanding right now. So apparently, Let's try a little later. That's Alexa. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the concept of metastases, metastasizing? Sure. So uh, I think people didn't know um, for a long time that metastasis metastasized. The first, I think, was Larry Norton and Joan Massingay. I'm sure someone, the first time I read about it, was that primary tumors and metastasis, both the primaries could recede themselves 
and metastasis could receive this uh, 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 primary. And that, that paper I showed you is from Nature. I think it's from Norway or Finland maybe, but they actually used DNA uh, sequence and evolutionary modeling to show that from Watopsy studies, to show that um, metastasis could actually, that, it, that, it, that there were tumor cells from one metastasis and another and so on and so forth. So if that's so, the more you try to reduce it, the more you ablate it, the better. Yeah. I, I have a question for the students. What, what was your general idea of metastasis before this talk? Feel free to unmute yourselves if you want to. I think my general idea of metastasis has been, or or what I've been taught is that once a cancer is metastatic and stage four, that it's systemic essentially and is therefore incurable. So the concept of oligometastasis hasn't really been commonly taught where I've learned about cancer. Right. I, I think that's, you know, exactly. If you look at the lay um, uh, conception of cancer. And I think this is true. I mean, you know, there, and I don't mean to riff on medical oncology, but it comes from, um, you know, medical oncology grew out of hematology and leukemia is uh, systemic, uh, no doubt about it. And it's treated with systemic agents like infectious disease was, right? I mean, it's the same idea, log reduction, da, da, da. But, but it's a very hard argument, but I, I would say, I can't prove it. A third, if you go up to six or seven mets, I bet a third to 40% of the cancers have present with less than six or seven mets. So I, I think that's right. I actually do have a follow up question for you. Yeah, of course. Uh, I know that certain cancers have sites where they, they, sites that they prefer to metastasize to. I think, for example, prostate cancer often metastasizes to the bone. Yeah. Do you see any overlap or a difference in the sites of what you would consider oligometastasis versus sort of more disseminated medicine? Yeah, I think, good, very good question. Adrenal for sure, uh, lung for sure, brain metza metza, occasionally bone. Um, I, it, it, the ones that seem most oligo, there's data on breast. And breast, is, it goes, that's not quite the question you asked, but uh, lung seems to be commonly oligo, and so does breast, and so does colon, actually. But um, yeah, I, I, it's hard to say the other way in terms of sites. But lung and liver are probably the two big ones. Thank you. Yeah, um, Ralph, there's a question from Andrew. He said, uh, what are some take-home lessons you've taken from your efforts to change deeply ingrained paradigms in the scientific community? Well, that's a good question. I think I didn't get too upset. I always so I never had much funding to do this outside the Ludwig because no one would give it to me because no one believed it. And I'm not, I mean, you know, it's not religion. I mean, it, it is or it isn't. So all you could do is make your best case. Um, I, I think it's getting more accepted. I, I do have to say that the radiation oncologists love it because it, it, it gets us into the systemic game and. Uh, and we get paid to do it, but I'm not sure that that's the strongest rationale for accepting the argument. But on the other side of the coin, I think some of the medical arguments against us are, are absurd. It's just ridiculous. Uh, the, the, to me, the evidence is overwhelming that it exists. What to do about it's an open question, but that there are stages of metastasis, uh, it, it seems to me is pretty, pretty, you know, it, it, it's pretty uh, obvious. Yeah, I mean, a little a little history for the, the students is that 100 years ago, there was a surgeon, Halstead, you might have heard of Halsteadian mastectomies, who believed it's, this was cancer progressed sequentially. So breast cancer would go to the lymph nodes and then slowly progress further. So the more local therapy you gave, the more chance you could cure somebody. So these women would have these radical mastectomies and even four quarter amputations and then i think ralph you can correct me if i'm wrong but in the 60s or 70s was bernie fisher right who said cancer is systemic 
you know, even when you have an early stage, small breast tumor, it's already spread in the body and it's a systemic disease and we need to treat it that way. And I think that's been the paradigm more so up until oligometastases, which is kind of the falls in the middle, right? It's Yeah, well, so the, the original argument was um, Hall, Halstead and Cushman Hagenson thought there was a only, only an orderly spread um, of breast cancer. And so the bigger surgery did, and Dr. Ferguson here, not this Dr. Ferguson, but his uncle, they did extended mastectomies with internal mammary node dissection. And local control is important. You can't cure somebody without local control. But in, the, in this context, they, they thought it was all sequential and that's it. Fisher was binary. Fisher said, well, it's, he actually thought it was almost, it was metast first he thought it was always metastatic. They all used to say breast cancer is a systemic disease, which it clearly isn't. And then they'd say, well, it's binary, it is or it isn't. And Hellman said, look, there's a, this is like anything else in biology. There's a, a spectrum of this. That's how we got onto this, actually, was from Sam had had any number of dust-ups um, uh, with Bernie Fisher. But, uh, but you know. Yeah, no, I was telling the students, actually, at the beginning of my talk about Dr. Hellman, but he was integral in the concept of breast conservation, so doing lumpectomy and radiation rather than doing a mastectomy. Um, which was also highly controversial when that started in the 70s and 80s. Um, yeah, yeah. The, the other thing, I mean, to be honest with you, um, the, so the top prize at the American Society for Clinical Oncology is the Karnofsky Prize. So Hellman and I both won that prize years apart for basically the same thing. And no, oncolog n n n n n n no oncologist in these regions won it once. So. I don't know if that proves anything, but I, I think this is, to me, fairly obvious. I mean, I can't say how to treat it or that it's gonna, some, you know, gonna make a material uh, difference in outcome, but I don't know, this is pretty good. All right, yeah, and um, you know what we'll do is maybe next year we'll plan your talk right after Dr. Olapade's, so the two of you- Sure, can that'd be great. I'll come back anytime. <laughs> <laughs>